UFC 225 middleweight champion Robert the Reaper Whitaker returns to defend his title in a rematch with the soldier of God, Yoel Romero. Whitaker became the first Australian to wear UFC gold in July 2017, when he overcame adversity to defeat Romero in a gruelling five-round war. Romero retained his spot as a number one contender with a devastating knockout of former champion Luke Rockhold, and now the world's two best middleweights are set to run it back in Chicago at UFC 225. Hello and welcome to UFC Inside the Octagon. John Gooden alongside Dan Hardy, and we are delighted to be back for this pay-per-view. Dan, Yoa Romero versus the champion Robert Whittaker. We saw this fight before. I'm not disappointed <laughs> to rerun this one. It's an excellent fight. It, it is a really good one. And the first one was competitive, and there were a lot of things that happened in that first fight that what leads me to believe that this second fight, this rematch, is going to be quite different. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that in the, in the playlists. But, yeah, absolutely. I could watch this fight three or four times over for sure. Yeah, yeah. There were some factors going into that fight that we only discovered after. But more about that. I'll let you explain mm. that. Let's get into it with the facts and the stats then and set this one up. We see the champion from Australia. I'm going to highlight these. The younger man is the champion. These are all very similar. Whitaker with the MMA experience, a bigger record there. Yeah, but then this is the thing that stands out on your Romero side. So the majority of his athletic career has been based in freestyle wrestling. I mean, you know, Olympic silver medalist, the, the credentials speak for themselves. And when he first started out in his MMA career, which, to be fair, I mean, he's 41 now. It was quite late in life that he did make the crossover. Yeah. So he was learning on the job. He was adding skills to his, to his already strong wrestling base. And because he's such a good athlete, it didn't take him long to start picking up knockouts as well. And whenever you see him move, you just think any second, it's like he's, it's like he's carrying a hand grenade that's going to go off at any second. And yeah. you just kind of, you just kind of waiting for that moment. Whereas Robert Whittaker, with the more experience in mixed martial arts, is still young in his game as well. So there's still many things that he, he can add to his game. Whereas at 41, I kind of feel like your Romero, he knows what he's working with now. He's got these tools to play yeah. with. He's got big power. He's got a good left knee but his wrestling is his base. Whereas Robert Whittaker, I feel like we see something new in his game every time he comes out. And with the long layoff, I'm expecting some big improvements. Yeah, and that means strategy is going to be very important for Romero. I just want to highlight this as well, Dan. Hapkido, traditional martial arts. I know Love that it. you're going to come up with something very soon that I want the viewers to, to keep in mind about that. All right, well, what better place to start than at the first fight? We haven't seen Robert Whittaker since he last fought Romero. He had a knee injury going into that fight. It was then made way worse within yeah. about 30 seconds. <laughs> He's been nursing that since. And with that in mind, I think we... we it's taken away a few tools that, or weapons that he might have used in that first fight, which makes it exciting to see what he's going to come back with. But let's recap the first fight. Yeah. Well, as you said, I mean, we did a breakdown of, of UFC 213, so do check that out, because we really do fully outline all the weapons that they yeah. used. But there were some things that I was expecting from Whitaker, which he didn't rely upon. But as you said, I actually think it was about 20 seconds into the first round where he got caught with that kick to the lead leg, which we're going to see in a second. And that seemed to affect his game massively because a lot of the time he relies on that forward pressure. Now, look at this. It was a psychic, very much a John Jones type of, type of uh, attack. And you can see Whitaker, he was moving gingerly on it. He was testing it. You could see it failed in there a little bit. He wasn't sure of the capabilities of that knee once he had the injury. But every time Yoel Romero went to repeat that attack, he got a big reaction out of, uh, of Robert Whitaker, which tells us that it was clearly bothering him. So as the, as the first round progresses, obviously Whitaker was expecting to be defending takedowns and I was surprised. I wasn't expecting him to be this resilient and mm -hmm. that um, explosive in his, in his defense. I mean, look at this excellent balance here. Really fast feet, which we talked about in the previous breakdown, but he, he absolutely uh, validated that, that statement uh, in, in this fight. And the thing that started to show every time he went for these takedowns and Yor Romero will put massive effort in because he's such a good athlete he uses that athletic ability sometimes over technique when he doesn't really need to and it can be exhausting now this was one of the one of the real solid takedowns I know there was four takedowns scored in the, in the fight I didn't actually score four takedowns two maybe three but this was one where he actually was able to keep Whitaker on the floor for a while and that was partly due to the knee injury but even so, Whitaker creates a scramble and gets back to his feet. He knows that the, the more time he spends in a wrestling clinch, the more the fight's slipping away from him. And Yoel Romero, because this is so familiar to him, you kind of expect him to be able to keep this, this pace up fairly relentlessly. 
But what we actually started to see is as the fight progressed and as Robert Whittaker defended takedowns, it got easier and easier for him. So then he started to come out of his shell a little bit, take a few more risks. As you can see, he leaps in with the big left hook there, but leaves himself exposed. But his takedown defense was there to back it up. So in the, in the best two rounds that we saw out of Yoel Romero, Robert Whittaker more than held his own in the wrestling clinch. Now, at the end of the second round, he scored one more takedown there just to finish that round, which was a nice statement. But then he goes back to his corner and typical Yoel Romero, you know, he, he kind of takes his time and he, you know, he drags his feet a little bit and likes to fill his lungs as much as possible. <laughs> you know, the beginning of the third round... You've been speaking to Tim Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> the beginning of the third round, Big John McCarthy's walking out of his corner. Clearly, he's gone over to say, hey, get up off your stool and let's go. Right. And Robert Whittaker, although he's standing in his corner and he knows his knees hurt, he's looking across at Yoel Romero, who's tired after 10 minutes of trying to wrestle and failing. And now Robert Whittaker feels like he can start you know, enforcing his game plan. So you start to see his confidence. He's fainting, he's moving in, still keeping that low center of gravity so he can sprawl if he needs to. But you'll notice that the takedown defense gets easier and easier for Whittaker. He almost starts to just shrug Romero off. And then he starts to work with this kick. Now we're gonna talk about this kick a bit later, but he was targeting the body predominantly here. Now, it was a sweeping motion. He was catching Romero to the body, but there's also a danger of Romero ducking onto the head. So that was something else in the back of Whitaker's mind. But again, every time uh, Romero's on him, he absolutely refused to accept the takedown and forced Romero to work for everything. And that really started to show. Romero started to slow down, take deep breaths. He's starting to get discouraged because, I mean, he's not used to failing so many takedowns. And then when you've got a guy like Robert Whittaker in front of you that moves so quickly and has got such a wide skill set, because Romero doesn't have a basis in uh, striking arts, there are a lot of things, a lot of unknowns in this, which means that he lent on the wrestling because it's the safest part of, of the right. game. It's the safest part of, of, of his game that he can rely on. He doesn't want to be out in the, in the, in the, in the centre training with Whittaker because he has so many skills that he can draw from and he's very, very quick and we know he hits hard as well. But then, you know, he keeps chasing these takedowns. This panic now in these takedowns. He's rushing, he's scrambling. He's using athletic ability and, and the cardio, uh, cardiovascular output in order to try and secure them. And it's failing. And he's just, it, it's slowly, you can start feeling the momentum moving over towards Robert Whittaker. And he's landing more shots. And he's being more diverse with his attack. He's starting to set it up. Yo Romero taking deep breaths. But he's even bailing out of takedown efforts now. He's trying for a takedown. If it fails immediately, he's just stopping. He either stops on his knees or he gets right back up to his feet. So again, Robert Whittaker starts to think, I can start pressuring more. He's more encouraged now to, to attack. He's less concerned about the reshot. So you'll see when he defends a takedown against Riol Romero, he's ready to strike immediately afterwards instead of defend a second takedown. And Romero just kind of slowly starts to come apart at the seams because he didn't have certain things in his game that that give him confidence, the backup of like he had in the Machida fight. Well, this is all going perfectly well, but I could finish this really quickly with a takedown and a few elbows. I mean, he was doing fairly well against Machida in that fight, but in the fight with Whitaker, because he was struggling in the kickboxing range and his takedowns were, were failing at the same time, he didn't have a great deal left. And th that was nice. Let me just touch upon this, because I watched this a few times. And to be honest, when I first watched the fight, I actually thought Romero had slipped here. I didn't realize that it was a knockdown. One thing we spoke about in the first show that we did is, is Whitaker's left hook, which is a real strong weapon for him. But I feel like it was, it was disabled to an extent because of the knee injury. But he does land it very nicely here. As Romero steps in for this kick, you can see Whitaker picks the leg up and then counters over the top, just glances across the side of his head, but it's enough to knock him off balance. And as you can see, Romero goes down there and there's no urgency to get back up either. I mean, he was hurt, but he went down and he accepted the fact that he was on the floor and that allowed Whitaker to finish really strong. You know, half guard, landing some powerful elbows, and Romero just looking absolutely exhausted. Mm. It was almost like he'd invested too heavily in the wrestling, expecting it to work really well, and when it didn't, there was no backup plan, there was no ability to adjust. I mean, you've got to wonder what adjustments he's going to make, you've got to wonder how he felt walking back to his locker room, and what, what his perception of the fight was before he even watched it back, because he would have remembered pushing really hard for 10 minutes, but then starting to slow down very quickly. Yeah. And how would he recalibrate that attack in a rematch? Yeah. Which is why it makes it so exciting that they're fighting again now. There's something that you've noticed as well, which is statistical, which is very important for what we believe to be the future game planning of Romero. Mm. I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you take a look at this thing okay. and talk us through it. <clears throat> so 
significant strikes. As you can see, there were more total strikes landed by Romero. A lot of them were in the clinch, short shots and those kind of things. The significant strikes were clearly on Whitaker's side, but that wasn't what I wanted to focus on. This is the thing that I find most interesting. Now, no takedowns on Whitaker's part. We kind of expect that. Yeah, he's tried six overall in his, in his UFC career. So that's 66.7%. That's four of six takedowns in his entire UFC career. Right. He's not a takedown guy. Yeah. You know, not interested in that. Romero, on the other hand, this is his current takedown accuracy. So it's 37%, which is 17 of 46. But if we look at his takedown accuracy before he stepped in there with Whitaker, it was 10 points above the UFC average. And that's 13 of 28. So you can see that... Of the 18 takedowns that he tried, the 14 that he failed massively impacted his statistics. Yeah. So not only did they affect his statistics, but they're also going to affect how he's going to approach future fights, especially if it's over five rounds. And we know here, look, the takedown defense of Whitaker is way above the UFC average, 25% yeah. above the UFC average. So we know he's got great takedown defense. And the takedown defense that Whitaker has was reinforced by this fight. The takedown accuracy that Yoel Romero had going into it was massively impacted by the fight. So I feel like that's going to be a major storyline going into this next one. OK, yeah, I was listening to a podcast with uh, Tyson Pedro and Robert Whitaker, and he underlined, if I take you down, you spring back up like mm. a cat. Super difficult to, to get him down, as, we, as evidenced by... You know, that statistic, yeah. he can do it in live fighting as well. And the other thing is, and I know, I know it said four of 18 takedowns, it's all up for debate. I actually don't think he scored four takedowns in that you, fight. You think two? I think two, maybe three. There's an argument for a third, but Robert Whittaker was on his knees for the most part, still getting back to his feet. Right. So unless you actually positioned your, your opponent on the floor on their back, I don't necessarily score it as a, as a full takedown. So there's even some debate around those stats. OK, well, let's look at things chronologically from what happened there. The rematch was supposed to happen, but sadly, Robert Whittaker took ill, wasn't able to walk out for his show in Perth, which was a heartbreak for him. But the fans got to see a great fight, or certainly a very good matchup between yeah. Luke Rockhold and Yoel Romero. I hand it over to you to show us what <laughs> happened in that fight. So we look at Yoel Romero coming out of that fight where he wrestled hard for 10 minutes and then fade. Then he comes into the Rockhold fight. Now, let me just quick pause this and just, just set a precursor here. So obviously Rockhold is excellent on the ground. Yep. Coming into this fight, Rockhold would have watched the Whitaker fight and he would have seen Yoel Romero chasing for those takedowns and getting tired. So I believe Rock Rockhold's approach to this one was to come in and pressure him to force him to wrestle. And if you look back into Rockhold's history, particularly the Bosch fight, he's very good at capitalising in scrambles and catching submissions. So I think that was his game plan. But what he got out of Yoel Romero was something very different. It was a guy that didn't shoot for a single takedown. It was a guy that, that didn't back up in the striking range. It was a guy that stood in striking range and, and built a shell around his head, basically. He used a lot of, a lot of hand movement and head Filipino movement. Filipino boxing. Yeah, very nice. But yeah. To move himself into range where he can then start to explode and fight in bursts like this, which is where his athletic ability comes into play. Rockhold knew that this was going to happen. He was expecting these wild bursts from Romero. But when he's not engaging in wrestling as well, these wild bursts are, are just as fast at the start of the fight as they are at the end. It's when he wrestles it intermittently that they, then he starts to slow down. Right. And then the unpredictables of, of Yarl Romero, striking to the lead leg to, to bring his focus down. So when he throws the big left hand over the top and then follows up with the shotgun shell to the face. Oh, I mean, we know how powerful this individual is. And, yeah. and because he's so relaxed the way he moves, I said it in the, in the previous show, he lulls you into a false sense of security. You think, oh, that's how fast he moves. And then all of a sudden it's 0 to 60 and you're unconscious and you just didn't see it coming. Yeah. At the same time, if you add that relaxed kind of style with a hammer fist to the leg and a jumping knee from a freestyle wrestler, who knows what he's going to do. So Rockhold was a little bit cagey. He was a little bit unsure where the target was going to be, what, what Romero was aiming for. So when he starts hitting the lead leg, he's open for that overhand left and... It was a beautiful finish, but a very, very different Yoel Romero to what we saw against Whitaker. Well, I think he's got himself a UFC Fight Pass subscription <laughs> because he took the, the Filipino boxing that we've been seeing from Anderson Silva, which hasn't yep. been hugely successful, if I'm honest. He then used a GSP, I call it the Travolta, yep. the, uh, the Superman jab to low kick. Yep. And then we My saw the blitz. That one. <laughs> <laughs> we saw the blitz, like the Tyron Woodley blitz. Yeah. It's like he's taken a few of these things from, from other fighters and uh, kind of introduced them to his game. Mm. But let's talk about the strategy from Luke Rockhold then, because what I find fascinating is 
you think high volume and putting Yoel Romero on a back foot is going to be the best way to stop that explosion. But actually, the only two people that have beaten him were Fei Zhao, when you said it earlier, I don't really think that Romero had had an awful lot of no. MMA uh, training before he went to Strikeforce. And then Robert Whittaker, who kind of uses a Romero-esque style of assault where it's blitzing. Yeah. It's in and out really quickly. Mm -hmm. It's like two collisions. Yeah. Maybe that's the way to beat him. Quite possibly, quite possibly. But now you've got two game plans that he could potentially adopt. The game plan that we saw in the first fight, which is come out, wrestle hard, try and get ahead on the judges' scorecards and capitalise and get a finish. I, honestly, I think he probably underestimated Whitaker going into that fight. You know, he looks at him, he's a young kid, coming up from welterweight. Yeah, I mean, he was on an unbeaten streak, but I'm Yoel Romero. You know, I'm an Olympic silver medalist and I knock people out with whatever I touch them with. So I think there was a little bit of underestimation on Yoel Romero's part. But then we see him in there against Rockhold as a very different fighter, a fighter that was quite happy to step into boxing yeah. range and block and not even attempt a single takedown. Yeah. So if you're Robert Witter coming into this one, you've gone, OK, I remember that Yoel. I sat and watched that Yoel. Which one am I going to get and how do I prepare for it? Yeah. Well, he's been levelling up. If you listen to any recent interviews, he's been levelling up in all areas of the game. He picked up his Brazilian jiu-jitsu yeah. uh, brown belt recently as well. Says that's always his mindset. He mm -hmm. just wants to improve everywhere, focus on himself, rather than going after any particular game plan. Do you yeah. think he saw anything in that last fight, though, between Romero and Rockhold that, he might, that might change his mind about his approach? I think, I think, I, 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 I feel like he said that he didn't see anything technically in that fight. Right. But there are cert he certainly saw that there was a difference in game plan, there was a difference in approach. And if nothing else, Romero defined his power weapons, his, his, his knockout power, how dangerous there. he is. Yeah, yeah, it's just a reminder because, you know, Whitaker wasn't hurt in that first fight. Other than the knee injury, he didn't catch a punch, he wasn't rocked, he yeah. wasn't put Good down. Point. So he didn't really feel that power. So it, it may be easy for him to underestimate Romero's power stepping in there for a rematch, yes. having not felt it. But when you see Rockhold getting blasted through the fence, then you, you, know, you just kind of go, well, I've got to watch out for that even if it didn't happen to me. Yeah. Now, given the fact that he's had so much time off and the fact that he's a young man, I know I keep going back to this, I'm not saying that older fighters don't still add things to their game, but when you're a young individual that, I mean, you're a UFC champion, you've got the weight of a continent on your shoulders, there are so many people that are following him and his career now, there's an urgency to add things to your game. Like, give me more things to play with. Give me a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu brown belt. Give me a, a different type of high kick. Give me some more striking tools with my hands. Like. All of these things are going to excite him and also add to his confidence going in there because he's not thinking about beating Yoel Romero. He's thinking about holding this middleweight belt for as long as he can. And there are going to be several different levels of adaptation that he's going to have to go through. The first one, obviously, is for Romero. But after that, he's going to have to continue to add things to his game to stay at the top of this division. Yeah, OK. Well, you mentioned at the top. We urge you to go and watch the Inside the Octagon for UFC 213 because we did go into more detail about some of the technical aspects. But let's remind ourselves of just how dangerous Yoel Romero can be outside of what we saw against Rockhold, which again just highlighted yeah. that huge power that he has. Yeah, well, the, the knockout over Rockhold was... It, it was the same weapon that we've seen him use so many times, but there's a diversity in that weapon because the setup is the same. We talk about that pronounced step on the back leg, the pronounced step to the left hand, or the pronounced step to the jump knee. Right. So there are a few things that he, that he does from, from that position. Now, early in his UFC career, we really saw that. I mean, just watch this. Springs off, but as soon as you see that pronounced step down off the back, I said it in the last show, that's danger. Get out of the yeah. way, because you don't know what's coming in your direction. Give yeah. him some space. Let him get it out of his system. <laughs> because whatever you, whatever you do, you don't want to be standing there waiting to see what he's throwing. Yes. Because yeah. if it's an overhand left, if it's a flying knee, if it connects, it's going to knock you out. There's no doubt about it. Now, against Machida, we spoke about this a little earlier, he kickboxed for him, with, with him for you know, two rounds. I mean, he was, like he was trying to test himself. But when he decided to get the fight over, it was over. Yeah. It's like he, he almost wants to play and test himself and see these new skills, but there was no play in the Whitaker fight. You know what I mean? There were, there were no things that he did in the Whitaker fight which, which told me, which, which insinuated to me that he was in a playful mindset. I mean, he was taking Whitaker very seriously after he'd failed those first few takedowns. And the one thing that Whitaker needs to watch out for, especially if he comes in with the game plan that he had against Rockhold, is Romero standing his ground. The danger with Romero standing his ground is that he is very fast, he does have knockout weapons, and as you just said, 
Whitaker likes to blitz forward. If you're blitzing forward, you're moving in a straight line. It's very difficult to pick an angle once you've started that momentum. As you can see here with Brad Tavares, Brad Tavares steps forward with a jab and bam, look at that. Now, I mean, he's in a very, very safe position, very, a very athletic position as well, because he slipped off to the side, his weight's loaded on his lead leg, and he's landed that elbow. Now, what you'll see a lot of the time, whether it's the elbow that he throws or the, or the left hand that he throws, a lot of the time his back leg will follow through, and then he'll swipe with the back hook. But that also sets up his takedowns. So all these things piece together very nicely. Right. But this elbow against, against uh, Brad Tavares just shows his willingness to stand in the pocket and try something new. Stand your ground, throw a big elbow. Watch this. Tucks off, pulls the lead arm down, comes over the top. Now, this is an Olympic freestyle wrestler landing a, an elbow that looks like a Muay Thai champion would throw. Mm. Bam, right on the side of the head. And that's a fight-changing technique there. Yeah. Even if it didn't knock his opponent out, as soon as they feel that, they know that they've been hit with something significant. And we talk about significant. Does it get more one. significant than no. that? Again, that pronounced step off the back leg and then he springs into the air. And his, his awareness, his spatial awareness, his ability to move around people, it's incredible. I mean, we could have dined out. We could have reviewed the last show over again and talked about all the lovely, you know, circling to the back that he does and this takedown offense where he just kind of floats through the air. And he's an incredible athlete, an absolutely amazing athlete. And, and it's nice that he's getting this second shot at Whitaker because I'm sure he, even at 41 years old, learned a lot from that first fight and will now step into this one, taking on the champion. He's not taking on a challenger like he was in the first fight. He was, he's taking on the champion now. So immediately there's another level of respect, which I think he's going to level up with Yael Romero as well. OK, interesting. We're talking of levelling up. I said it earlier. We believe that Whitaker is levelling up currently. So that's exciting. And also, if we did see a debilitated Robert Whitaker in that first fight, how exciting uh, coming forward. So again, maybe let's have a look at what he's capable of and what we've seen throughout his, his career in the UFC. Absolutely. And, and, and you say, you know, the, the knee was probably affecting him. 20 seconds into the first round, he's probably throwing yeah, it things was, out it of his game It was. It definitely did affect him. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, he, yeah. He's literally, you're going through your game plan and going, well, that technique doesn't work anymore. That technique doesn't work anymore. I can't try that. So we don't really know what his game plan was going into that fight because we didn't even see a moment of it. You know, the yeah. first 20 seconds was just a bit of moving around before he got the damage to the leg. So we can only really look back at the things that we've seen. And they're the things that, that you took into the fight in the first place. We've not learned a great deal. So I expect there to be a lot of things that we're going to miss that we just won't have seen because he's been away from the octagon for so long. Yeah. But the things that he took up to middleweight when he did move, this was his, his, his middleweight debut against, uh, against um, uh, Hesse. It was a really nice performance and it was a very varied attack as well. There we are, John. <laughs> Sitting on the good side. Best seats in the house. But, you know, it was, it was left hooks, it was high, high kicks, it was knees, it was blocking low kicks and countering low kicks. You know, there were a lot of different things that he showed in that, in that uh, fight that he's now reinforced over the, last few, uh, over the last few bouts that he's had. And he's really started to show his, his game to be a very, very strong, well-rounded one. And some things he does so well, his left hook is one of my favourite weapons, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dine out on in a little while. But the head kick is something that, here we go, look at that. Now... The head kick I find fascinating because it's slightly different to the way most people throw it. And the reason that I find this beneficial is because his hips stay very square. So look how his knee comes up here. As his knee comes up, his knee tops out and stops just above the head. So as he throws the second part of his leg through, the knee stops, but the leg continues to extend. Mm. But you think if the knee stops there, then it can retract. As soon as the knee goes past the center line, you're spinning or you're going to hit your target and the, the kick will stop there. Now, if you're fighting a guy that wants to shoot on your legs, you keeping square hits to him is very, very beneficial. And another thing I thought I think helped with that kick as well is because there was some damage to the knee and he wasn't forcing himself to turn on that leg, that was still a weapon he could utilize in the fight. I just don't think he could put the full power into it that we saw in, say, the Jackery fight, for example. I mean, look at that. Walked him right onto that kick. And you can go back to the Romero fight and you can see two instances where the kick just, I mean, literally whiffed across the top of his head. If your Romero had not shaved with a razor that morning, <laughs> he would have caught it clean. I mean, they were so, so very close, but I still feel like some of the power was stolen out of those, those kicks because of the damage to the lead knee. And if that's becoming a, a major weapon in his game, then he's going to find lots of new ways of using it. So I'm expecting that to be a, a serious weapon for this next one. The front kick of... Yeah of Robert Whittaker. Yeah, the Sparta kick. <laughs> yes, and that, he was able to use that 
because it didn't affect the twisting and the talking on that ligament on his knee. And one thing I found is that when he was using that kick, it was almost like a, it stopped Romero when he was in full flight trying to come forward. Yes. And it, I think that's when I was saying earlier on, maybe his traditional martial arts technique and style, that's the reason why he throws it that way and it's, it's kind of a byproduct is. Yeah. What a great weapon against Romero. Absolutely. And, and, it, and it's a snap kick as well. So as I was talking about, as the knee comes up and it stops, it tops out so he can snap the rest of the kick out, he can bring it back and retract it. But at the same time, there were, there, there was, there were opportunities where as Romero was level changing to come in, Whitaker was throwing the kick and Yell Romero was actually level changing and meeting the knee. Yes. So th there are different levels of defense. The knee comes up first, so you can catch them with the knee. If they're further out of range, you can extend it to the, to the head kick. And as you were talking about with the push kick, which was a real useful weapon against yeah. Romero, a part of the reason that was useful, I'm going to borrow you for a second. So if you, st you, you could be your Romero, John, you can do your, you know, Good Lord. Cuban bounce. <laughs> are, we, are we going Southpaw? Yeah, so you're Southpaw for me. So I'm Robert, Weir I'm a Rob Robert Whittaker, so I'm Orthodox. Now, just for argument's sake, switch to Orthodox for me. Now, if I use this back leg kick and I'm yep. throwing that at your midsection to stop your forward momentum and I miss, or say I hit you and you're a sweaty mess and I slide off to the side, bam, I land yep. and I'm, That's... I'm in serious danger here. Yeah. But you switch back to southpaw, I'm in this position, I throw that kick. Even if I land and slip off, I'm still square to you. Yeah. It's not ideal, but it's still safe. Yeah. You're not giving your back. So I feel like that was a really useful weapon that we've not seen him use against many other people because he's fought a lot of orthodox fighters. Against Whitaker, against Romero, it was the perfect tool to stop him dead in his tracks. Yeah. And as you said, because Romero loves that sprint forward, you need something to negate that attack. You need something to discourage it. The knee to kick is very useful, but the push kick is a, is a dead stop every time. Yeah. And not only do you stop that momentum, but you push them back so you can follow and it creates space for his blitz. Yeah. So there are loads and loads of tools for him to use. The, the one more thing I want to dine out on though is his left hook. Okay, well let's take a look at that then, because that's so, a real X factor yeah, for him, isn't it? I mean, this is something I feel like he would have utilized in the first fight had it not been for the knee injury. And I feel like had he utilized it in the first fight, he may have caught Romero clean, but if he hadn't, even if he had not knocked him out with it, he would have shown Romero that there's a hole in his game that no one's yet exploited. And the reason I'm going back to this is because we've seen him do it so many times. Earlier in his career, if he's fighting an orthodox fighter and they're throwing kicks to the inside of his leg, he, he does this, he sweeps at it, which, I mean, there, look, it's a very Muay Thai thing to do, but usually it's a teep to the midsection, you would sweep and you'd still be covered. But because Romero is so flamboyant and everything he does is so, <laughs> is so, so broad and so overly exaggerated, when he does that sweep, he's covered here, perfectly fine on that side of his head, but this side of his head, he's not covered at all. And you think about the speed that he has moving forward, and the one that always sticks out in my mind is his fight against Brad Tavares. Now, here's Brad Tavares here doing it, and you can see him sweeping, again, Rockhold as well. Sweeping, leaves himself open there all the time. If you rock hold, it's very difficult to exploit that because you don't necessarily have the weapons because it's difficult to go from here to a right hand. But the technique that Whitaker uses so well is that left hook and he used it there against uh, Brad Tavares. So what you'll see is he'll come through with the back foot, front kick, and then he steps forward. Now, same thing I was talking about with the hip staying square on the kick. So he's either coming up with the front kick here or the turning kick. His hips are still square. Usually on a left hook, someone's gonna turn into the left hook which can be dangerous. Someone can disappear underneath and take you down. But Whitaker steps forward, keeps his hips square, and turns the punch over. And I feel that's a, that's a very, very useful weapon against Romero, because if you faint that inside low kick and he sweeps at it, you can go whew, and then straight forward with that left hook. And I just feel like that's, that's, that's his ace card in this fight. And I don't feel like he could do it in the last fight because as he's stepping forward, that MCL is going to give, and that's where he was feeling the pain. So there was a hesitation in using that technique. What a fight. Buzzing. It's Can't wait. so <laughs> exciting that there's more to see, potentially yeah. from Whitaker, And obviously Romero changing things up as well. I think it's really going to pull on the intelligence of both camps. Who can change things up in this time, get the right strategy, yeah. and, uh, and then put it all forward. And the urgency, you've got to think Romero's 41. You know, that's he, a really good point. He needs this. He needs to get his hands on this belt because yeah. if he doesn't, two, three more fights down the line, you've got a 42-year-old challenger, yeah. maybe a 43-year-old challenger. 
You know? it, it is a division where people have these extra chances, though, isn't it? That's very Obviously true. Obviously referencing Michael Bisman. Yeah, very true, very true. Um, happy yeah. retirement to Michael Bisman, by the way. Dan, it's always a pleasure. Thank you very much for watching. Continue the conversation using the hashtag InsideTheOctagon. And we hope you enjoy the fights. We'll be back for the next one. Thanks for watching.